Uh, thank you. And thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, BS, for organising the forum and the sponsors. Thank you for DFAT for um, uh, sponsoring and also for funding uh, flu tracking. Uh, thank you to the Fijian people and the wider Pacific community for um, being here and uh, sharing so much, um, learning, seeing a lot of leapfrogging, uh, quite impressive leapfrogging. So good to get back to Australia and uh, and tell them what's happening elsewhere in the world and uh, so advanced. So Bulla, um, thank you um, for having me here. Uh, I want to just also introduce Sandra Carlson. Where are you, Sandra? Please stand up. She's going to hate me for this. <laughs> Sandra's the manager of flu tracking. Uh, she makes it run. Uh, she really does. Uh, she's very careful. She's a biostatistician. And um, many of the reasons, uh, probably all of the reasons that it works, is because of Sandra's careful um, governance of the system. So, looking for a button to put. Oh, here we go. Space bar. Thank you. <laughs> so, basically, if you look at that phone on the left, that is kind of what people see when they see flu tracking, apart from the web website when they uh, look at data. And it's a system that very quickly and easily collects data on influenza and COVID-like illness and other conditions. It tracks illness severity and health-seeking behaviour. And we didn't think that would be so important, but during COVID we learned a lot about health-seeking behaviour and how important it was. And then it tracks vaccination status. And I might go back, Sandra might, might go back to a demo that people can try later uh, if I forget. So... Um, it's syndromic surveillance. It's participatory syndromic surveillance because it is um, something that people do in the palm of their hands with a smartphone uh, or on a laptop or on a PC. And syndromic surveillance is about symptoms or symptom complexes, symptom clusters, not laboratory results. So we can't be sure always that someone has the condition that we're hoping to find. Um, and but it can be complement laboratory data. So even in Australia, we have great laboratory services that are free and quite available. Sometimes they don't work so well uh, in times of epidemics because they go up and down in their, their service. And this syndromic surveillance going to the grassroots community level where anyone can do it has this constancy factor. People answer the same every week if they've had cough or fever. So it can give us a, uh, another perspective, another reality check on what's happening at a grassroots level. And of course, syndromic surveillance has been recommended by WHO for all countries to make a complete cohesive um, a suite of responses to pandemics, to have a really good response that they can look at from many different angles. So flu tracking is now in uh, four countries, uh, started in Australia in 2006. Um, it's one of the largest uh, surveillance systems in the world with, I think, about 150,000 in our peak week during um, COVID. Uh, and typically 100,000 across the four countries. It takes less than 30 seconds. And that's been one of the big um, reasons it's, it's done so well. There are other systems elsewhere in the world that are much longer and their participation week to week and over years is much less. And... Um, we'd love to add extra questions. You know, every question we add, we could lose 15% of respondents. Um, and knowledge DFAT uh, for supporting establishment of uh, flu track in the Pacific. So where do flu trackers come from? What's this in Australia? And of course, this would change in other countries. We put out media releases, newspaper articles, especially the online newspaper articles, because people can just click straight through to the join page. Um, Radio doesn't work so well, but we've got to remember it. Um, one thing that did work well, we got about 20,000 people joined when our Deputy Chief Health Officer suggested that people join in the middle of the pandemic. We focus on um, reaching out to large institutions like universities, large workplaces, where there are many people sitting at computers where they can get an email, um, such as the email um, example down here. Um, they can get an invitation to just click on that and join. It takes about mm, probably less than a minute to join. And this is the sign-up page. We don't ask much, just the very bare minimum, so that we can get people on board pretty quick. 
and also acknowledging that people don't want to share too much in terms of um, protecting their privacy and confidentiality. Um, you can maybe able to see. <laughs> We do a log scale here, but in 2006, we started with 400 people just in our local health district. And then it grew quite rapidly. 2009 was a big increase because of the H1N1 influenza pandemic. And then, of course, with the pandemic of COVID-19, it's, it's dramatically increased. And participation is good. 60% of participants complete 90% plus of weekly surveys. So... Uh, we do get good week-to-week -week, um, participation. Just to show you how rapid the uh, the uh, responses are, this is a point. Is pointer? Maybe it's not a pointer. It's right. This is a pointer. <laughs> we send the email out at one o'clock in the morning. And you can see there's people awake at that time and there's nothing better to do than do food tracking. So when it comes through, but here, look at this, between eight and nine, 12,000 people respond to the survey. So it's quite, it's quite good for getting a very rapid response on, we don't need a hugely rapid response for flu tracking, but for other things we might uh, in emergencies. Oh, someone's got a phone, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, so my finger had started. Uh... <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it can be quite rapid. And basically by Tuesday, send out Monday morning, by Tuesday, we've got a very good idea of what's going on. So that's, you know, from basically the survey finishes on data to Sunday. And Tuesday, we can put out a report that gives a pretty good idea of what's happening. Thursday, we do a more complete report, but it pretty much is clear by the Tuesday, a few days after the um, week of interest. So... Second, oh, a little, thank you. So this is the kind of a pyramid, surveillance pyramid that we talk about um, from uh, mildest disease down to more severe uh, disease. And typically health facilities pick up, you know, the higher end of the mild disease, moderate, and then severe illness gets picked up in the hospitalised and of course the death registration. Um, so this is at the bottom of the pyramid is these undetected community cases, the people who don't appear on any data system. And they can provide a lot of information because they're an important part of the pyramid. It gives us the ratio, the ratio of these people down here to these people and uh, hospitalised and health facilities. It's really important to see how, that's, how that changes with different diseases and over time. And that's where flu tracking can give us. this because we, we know if people have gone to a health facility and if we know if they're hospitalised, um, because they report on that, of course. So, how can flu tracking help with some common issues? Oh, that's interesting. We're throwing out out of order. So, <laughs> okay. So, there's often missing data in health facilities and dramatic surveillance. Often, competing priorities, staff shortages, all lead to aberrations in data and just changes in training, changes in motivation. Uh, so, flu tracking can provide consistent levels of community level surveillance, regardless of what's happening in the health facilities. And we'll show you some slides on how this changes during emergencies during pandemics. So syndromic surveillance can be a burden on busy health facility and public health staff. And because this is direct or direct to the community, um, there's no burden on staff, either at the department level or at the clinic level. And if there's changes in our case definition or questions, we don't need to go and retrain people at a clinic on, on how to uh, complete the survey. <laughs> So it can often be difficult to rapidly add a new syndrome for monitoring at health facility level, but we can add a new syndrome in a matter of days to about two weeks for a very big change uh, in this system. And I'll show you some examples where we've, um, where we've done that. So just to talk to you through what we saw during the pandemic of COVID-19, you can see this is our surveillance uh, in... Uh, October uh, through to October of uh, 2019, before the pandemic. And we normally finish in October. It's a, we usually do just do the winter flus and herties. So then we started um, again in uh, late March of uh, 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, we could see it coming as everyone could. And you could see what happened was that the basic cough and fever rates in the community just dropped. 
as social distancing and other, and particularly for Australia, an island nation being able to close uh, entry, basically stopped all the influenza that would normally come, and other earthies that would come in um, through the borders. Dropped very low, very low through most of the pandemic, as you know, um, we had, as, as many of your countries did, had quite uh, stringent controls in place. And then uh, we didn't really see much of a rise during the pandemic. Um, it was actually relatively small. But then we saw the BA1 Omicron surge come here, and then the BA2, and then a combined influenza and COVID surge coming in 2022. And then the mixed, as they called it, the often uh, Omicron soup coming in later, October through December. And then the subsequent um, subsequent iterations this year. And we're now seeing a drop, which is good. So this is from the self-reported testing behavior. You can see here that um, this is the percentage of participants reported uh, getting tested. And in the early days, this was really useful to us because government thought that we were getting all of the cases, you know, that we're picking up up to 85% of COVID cases. And what this tells us was if only 40 to 50% in the early days were actually being tested, we couldn't possibly be getting 85% of cases. And this is, flu trackers tend to be highly health literate, highly vaccinated, so highly likely to get tested. So this is probably best case scenario we're seeing here. And then we see in um, late 2021 with the advent of rats, um, we could see this massive increase in the proportion of people getting tested through both, this is both PCR and rats. And, uh, you know, well above 90% for most of the time. So it's really useful. And the modelers, uh, we work a lot with the Doherty Institute at Melbourne University. The modelers love this kind of information because it really helps them to do their forecasting, forecast whether we're going to get another peak or not, or whether we're um, going to live in lovely hybrid immunity. So it's been very useful for that kind of uh, planning and uh, prediction. So this is busy, um, but I'll try and step you through it. Here's the weekly case count um, of uh, COVID-19. And in our in blue here is the flu tracking, sorry, no, no, in brown is the flu tracking data, percent positive uh, PCR. So we're asking people, did you get a test? Yes. What was it? So it's PCR. And this is them telling us whether they are positive. So we had the number of getting tested, and the number of tests are positive to give us this weekly um, percent positivity. And what you'll see here is the case counts are in blue in New South Wales. Whoops. And you can see that the count was massive here um, over, you know, almost 250,000 people uh, in, in the early part of Jan 22 drops down with subsequent waves quite massively, you know, the difference there. But if you look at the percent positivity of PCR tests, yes, the first peak was high, maybe double the others, but you can see that the subsequent peaks in the other Omicron waves still pretty high, didn't drop off like that. And that's where percent positivity is very useful to give you an idea of what's happening if fewer people come to get tested. And that's what was happening here. So the blue line drops a lot because people are less likely to present later in the pandemic. And so just to show you, flu tracking was actually quite useful um, in its percent positivity being able to give a very similar data source to the percent positivity from labs showing that the subsequent uh, pandemic strains are still pretty, uh, pretty hard hitting. And so that's, this could be useful in countries that actually don't have, um, say, widespread laboratory data, and particularly if they don't have percent positivity to show the impact of decreased testing. Okay, from the 2009 pandemic, going back, way back. So the bottom line of this slide is that it's quite interesting because flu tracking had only been going three years 
And we had, we we're showing very different data to the laboratory and emergency department data. And so uh, a lot of people, including us at first, thought our data was wrong. But it was actually right. And what happened was, um, if you look at flu tracking data, first of all, here was 2007. It was a very big flu year for us. Here's 2008, very mild flu year. Here's 2009. And it didn't feel as bad as 2007 in terms of... Um, in terms of here on this uh, axis, the uh, cough rate, the percent of people with cough, we were really surprised, like, how can this be? We've got this massive pandemic, the ICUs are full, but we're saying it's not, not as bad. If you look at the emergency department data here in Brown, the massive increase compared to 2007, massive increase. And then in the green is lab notifications, massive increase in flu. Anyone think why that might be so different? Why might it be so different? I'll answer. Shall I answer? Okay. <laughs> so, um, if basically everyone who had a cough or fear were told to go and get tested, you know, and people were panicky. There were signs outside, you know, the newspapers were saying 40,000 Australians to die. So people were very, very nervous. Um, and so they got increased testing. And so these systems did report what was happening, but it gave an uneven picture. So because we could see that, all right, there is, um, it's a big flu year, no doubt, but the ICUs are full. So we did, this led to a study where we compared the rate of ICU admission among people who had seasonal flu, H3N2, compared to those who had this new pandemic strain, H1N1. And we found that there was a fourfold increase likelihood of ending up in ICU with the pandemic strain. So this is what, trying to figure out what this meant led to that study and was quite helpful. So flu tracking can be used for almost anything where you want to get a rapid um, understanding of what people are experiencing out there at the grassroots community level. And in the 2019-20 Australian East Coast bushfires, um, everyone was wondering what the impact was, and it was hard to understand it. Um, so, and I think you probably remember, I think the smoke got all the way out to Fiji, actually, I think, in that. It certainly hit the Pacific pretty hard. It was a massive bushfire series of bushfires. Well, that was out of order. Yeah, okay. So, um, we added some questions to flu tracking about uh, cough, runny nose, uh, sorry, about um, sore eyes and uh, sore throat from the um, bushfires and rolled it out to the area that was most impacted. And also to other areas by, by comparison. And this shows the um, any symptom of sore eyes, sore throat, cough, wee, shortness of breath, sneezing, chest tightness, um, and then psychosocial impacts of the bushfire. And then we were able to map it, and you could see that the, the worst symptoms, of course, were in, felt down here in the areas where the bushfires were most uh, concentrated. So it was kind of a proof of principle that it could be used for other environmental health impacts. Um, we have, a, uh, we have um, a strong public health Aboriginal health team in our unit, and they've been really helpful um, in developing flu tracking to look at Indigenous health issues. And we have a strong cultural governance um, group that actually oversee any design uh, of work done on First Nations people and in reporting. And so, sorry, obviously this is the last minute. So this is the last minute edition, this, this graph. I could, couldn't find it until late last night. So what this, and part of the cultural governance process with our Aboriginal um, partners, is that they do not like us to show uh, First Nations and non-First Nations data on the same slide. So I'm just going to show the First Nations data here, but it's showing it over several years. And 2020, pandemic year, but 2019-18 overlaid. And what's interesting here is that 
everyone in Australia who works in flu would say 2019 was a really bad year. Uh, they would say that 2018 was a mild year. But what this showed was that for our First Nations participants, it was equally as bad. And we also found that 2017 was a bad year for First Nations, uh, for non-First Nations people, but not so much for First Nations people. Then in 2018, they got hit really hard. And so it's been able to really tease out some differences that the traditional surveillance systems weren't finding. So this is something we're exploring now, as, as you all know, with uh, uh, climate change, there are some really huge impacts, uh, particularly in some of the mega cities, uh, in cities that have a lot of concrete black surfaces uh, that absorb heat and then radiate it locally. And um, it's expected that uh, temperatures above 50 degrees will not be uncommon in many of these places going forward every year. And there'll be massive um, death toll associated with it. So we're exploring with a group um, the idea of a heat tracker adaption because while there's meteorological predictions, they can predict the weather, the humidity, the, the experience that could be there. It's unclear yet how that really relates to the lived experience of someone uh, particularly living for us in Western Sydney in this zone where it's, the heat is concentrated and radiated, a lot of black roofs, lots of black bitumen. And so the idea is that we will survey them occasionally, but then during heat waves, survey them regularly and understand, do you have air conditioning? Do you have fans? Do you have insulation under the roof? And then it's indicators of what the lived experience was, like, you know, did, did you sit in a bath all day to keep dry? Did you keep cool? Uh, did you miss sleep this week uh, due to the heat? So that's something that's emerging. And at the moment, we're currently, um, we have funding for um, Fiji from DFAT, and this is currently undergoing review by Fiji Cabinet to see if it's suitable and appropriate for Fiji. The idea of the rollout um, at Fiji or other countries, it's no extra routine work for the health department or health staff clinics. Um, there's initial stage to you know, consultation to understand how flu tracking can help, what syndromes or questions, what sort of registration data is needed. And the, the syndromes, you know, are basically whatever you can ask on a survey, whether it's ILI, the DLI, complex, watery, bloody, diarrhea, um, any syndrome really. Um, now to show you what um show alt tab? Yeah. Yeah, drag it across for you. This is a, a visualization many have seen and known well. Unfortunately, it's just restrained this time. We're tracking, but this is the Tupaya interface. Yeah, that's great. There you go. Great, thank you. So, wow. So, basically, can I, I can control plus to zoom, I guess. Sure. So, this is the interface that uh, countries will have uh, for using uh, flu tracking through Tupaya. And there are many, many, uh, I'd encourage you to Google Tupaya flu tracking Australia, and you'll find that you can play with it yourself. But you can look at the LGA level, which is a pretty small um, area for us, all the states. Uh, you can look at uh, the percent of people with fever and cough. There's vaccination data, there's participation data. Um, this is pretty nice over here. I'll just this is the age breakdown, and you can see that pretty children have much higher rates of um, respiratory illness. And, if, and you probably all know this very well, but um, of course you can download the data, so it makes it very easy to use. You can download just an image to put in a report or you can export into Excel and play with it more. So that's, again, something that BES have done for flu tracking, which is going to increase the you know, ease of use of the system dramatically. And it looks beautiful. Yeah? Yeah, thank you. So I'll just go through these. So flu tracking, I guess, that's where we started. What is it? Well, you know, we start off with just this little mobile phone app. Actually, it's not an app, it's web. Um, 
for a number of reasons we can discuss if you want to. But it's much more than just a database. Um, uh, it's, it's an IT infrastructure that's been optimised over 18 years to maximise response rates, really. And I think that's one of the things that's unique. The team really works very hard to optimise response and ease. And the question development process uh, and testing, a lot of testing has been put together to maximise response rates. And the recruitment process has been optimised again over the last 18 years to really increase. And it's not just to get new people in, it's not to lose people. So we have lots of ways they can opt out, you know? Are you, do you want to take some time off? Do you want to come back next year? Uh, that sort of thing, to optimise uh, the experience. This is just a little example of how we optimise questions. So uh, it's a small team, but... Um, we do this with our questions. We can introduce a new question. We workshop with a lot of people. This is just a, um, a message that we, we're going to put in an email reporting back to our participants. They get a weekly report every week, but occasionally we um, get another short message. So we'll write out these four or five short messages that we'll, we think you know would be good to give back. And then three of us will take three or four forms and we'll go around and talk to three or four people. So I have you know, 12 sponsors internally. we we'll ask them to rank them. What, which of these short messages do you think our flu trackers would find most um, motivating? And so then we'll come back, compare notes and pick the one that um, ranked best, which, yeah, that's how we, so we do that on lots of um, questions. We also split test lots of things and, um, with internet marketing, this is done a lot. You know, you might go to a website, one person will be shown one headline, someone will be shown something else, different offers, different email subject headings. Um, and so we do this a lot because when you've got thousands of people, you can just test with, you know, 500 here, 500 there and, and just optimise your responses. So here's one split test we did. We used to just say, and one of our best recruitment methods is asking other flu trackers to recruit other, other people that they know. So we used to ask them to invite their friends. And uh, we thought, well, and we talked to people about their experience and, you know, they, they said, you know, um, maybe you should tell us to invite a particular number of friends so we have a target. We thought, okay, let's ask them to invite five friends. So we did this, and then after a while we heard someone I actually won't tell you too much. I'll just get you to guess. So we then split test. We sent emails saying, please invite your friends. Another one saying, please invite three friends. Another one, invite five friends. Which one do you think recruited the most people? Three. Who says five? No one says five. Who says friends? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's see. What happened there? Yeah. All right, so here's what happened. Um, basically, this led to a 7.9% our usual questionnaire join rate from the emails that went out. Three friends, 18, five friends, 9.2. That's a massive difference, isn't it? It's funny being up here. I can see all these people congratulating themselves for saying three friends. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. You're right. Three friends. We should have just known that, shouldn't we? Instead of having to do all this. <laughs> so, um, it was quite interesting uh, to see that. And then you talk to people, and they go, they they give us feedback. They go, yeah, like five friends was kind of paralyzing. I had to think of so going through so many people. Three friends was easier. All right. So then we thought, well, should we stop there? Should we invite three friends or two friends? What do you, which one do you think went best? Who thinks two friends? I'm going to make you hold your hands up so you can. <laughs> three, oh, three friends. And two friends? Okay. So do this. I want everyone, one, the people who said two friends want to put two arms up now. <laughs> People who said three friends, would you put three arms? <laughs> All right. So 
Here we go. Two friends slightly better, yeah. <laughs> so they said, you know, much easier. And then when I have to think of two friends, I think of the best two friends that will answer the survey. So that's, we think that's really important. They really think through, who do I know who will answer this survey? And, and it's more highly selected. And I think that's part of the reason why people continue and answer week after week and some for years now throughout the pandemic. And these are some, um, you know, why do they keep doing Well, Here's some of the messages we get, you know, on our social media. And we actually did a survey of people asking them why they did it. And the first thing they, they stopped and said was, actually, I don't know often, you know, that, that was a hard question to answer. But when you push them, they kind of said, well, it only takes 20 seconds and I feel like I've done something good for medical research on a Monday morning. So I think that's what we align. A lot of people look about rewarding people for participation, but I think it's important to reward them perfectly aligned with their motivation. Their motivation is to help medical research, public health research. So the best you can do is tell them what they're doing in terms of the impact they're making. Um, some systems have tried giving iPads out and things like that to groups that recruit well, but after they've got the iPad, they often don't answer the survey anymore. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so it, it's a highly motivated group that just like to help research. So in summary, this is a low maintenance, stable and flexible syndromic surveillance system. It reaches beyond the traditional health facility surveillance. It has automated reporting. It's got great visualization through Tapaya and much more tables download. It's flexible for new syndromes. And if you want to discuss further, please contact me on that email address, which is through the tracking website. And again, thank you um, to Peter Sandra, who manages flu tracking. Um, to our small team and the uh, tens of thousands of people respond to flu tracking every week. Thank you. Thank you, Dalton. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, yes, it's a quick one. <laughs> um, you didn't talk about um, the demographic. Of the, of the cohort that's filling in. Do you, do you have some analysis on the age of gender? We do, yeah. yeah. Obviously, you, you mentioned there's sort of like a little bit of highly, higher educated cohort, but you know, do you have a good geographic spread? Yeah. Good question. From a, it's when it works at AHW, <laughs> predictable question. So, um, yeah, so it is a higher CS group for sure. And that produces bias. And one of the studies that we're going to do is compare it to some um, more representative surveys done of uh, the wider community during COVID. So that's important. So we we can see the bias in it. They're high, more highly vaccinated. Um, we do have uh, their postcode of residence, and we do uh, social CIFA social analysis to basically compartmentalise into different groups, and we can see that that makes a difference. So we'll see the uh, lower socioeconomic groups get hit earlier and harder during the pandemic, the first pandemic, that's clear. Um, and uh, gender-wise, there are more females. Uh, the males tend to report for a longer period of time. We last did the analysis, which surprised us. Um, we, we're down about 10 or 15% in age distribution in the elderly and the young. And the young are a constant challenge because if you want an under five-year-old, you've got to recruit every, you know, quite regularly to keep the young children coming through. But, so that is a challenge. Any other questions? I've got one. What, um, do you foresee any challenges or differences trying to implement this in Fiji or elsewhere in the city compared to Australia? Sure. Um, most of them will be unforeseen to me. So this will rely on, on partners to, um, I guess, figure out what they think needs to be done in terms of syndromes, in terms of promotion particularly, um, what channels would be best to promote it through, uh, what conditions people will be motivated and interested in to report. 
you can't ask people to report a really, really rare condition uh, because if they think they've got no chance of ever reporting it, um, then that they'll, you know, they'll lose interest. It'll be many. So big consultation process. Yeah. Anyone else? Why? I'd say, um, I see now that you're using it in Hong Kong and you've also gone live in Argentina last year. Um, I don't really know anything about Argentina, but I don't imagine it being as um, densely populated as Hong Kong. And when you're trying to um, break down like geographically the data in Hong Kong, that must be like an extremely different challenge. Well, even just comparing it with Australia when um, it's so highly urbanized and so um, densely populated to um, to try and pull the stories out of that. I, I don't know, I'm just curious about the different challenges you've seen in Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah, so Hong Kong's an interesting case. Obviously, I think the population's about 5 million um, and very dense, which is good. They've only got um, small participation numbers at the moment and there are there are some challenges in recruitment in Hong Kong, and we've learned a lot from that. Um, they certainly picked up the pandemic when it hit hard. You know, it certainly showed with the small numbers. And there's a lot of questions about how many you basically need to, how many people you need. Some studies uh, in the US and different state levels have suggested that you need between 250 to 400 people to get a reasonable correlation with lab data at a state level. And, They've got very obviously big and small states. It seems to always be around that number to get a basic trend. Of course, what you can't get with that number is a breakdown by any demographics, age. So, and uh, so that's really important. And you, you can't get really good insight into um, testing behavior with those small numbers. UK were able to get a vaccine efficacy um, effectiveness of the vaccine during the pandemic with only about 500 participants in 2009. So that was surprising. So it can be possible. Ideally, you, you know, 1,000, 2,000 is a great number to have to start getting real insights. Anyone else? Any questions? Um, just about how the data can then be integrated back to the health system itself. To inform public health and so on. Um, same here in Fiji. So who are you going to partner with? How's the Ministry of Health itself going to benefit from this? Yeah, look, I think in terms of how the partnership will work, it's very early days. I think it's just going through cabinet for um, uh, review at the moment. So that's still to be, um, I guess, explored. Um, I, it'll be a typical prioritisation process on the part of. Uh, health department to say what their priorities are and then I think map to what flu tracking can offer. Um, it, it may fill gaps if there are gaps. It may be complementary so that there's a consistency that can help um, with the interpretation of laboratory and other syndromic data should that fall over or should that change sometime. And it may change for a good reason, like there's more laboratory capacity and so the tests go up. This can provide particularly a baseline data. Source. Hey, any other questions? Oh, yes. I'm going to stand up. Um, I, I saw some kids trying to take a photo of your email group, so maybe go back to the previous slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, my question is whether during the pandemic, when you got such a large increase in users, did you have to do anything? to allow it to scale to handle the new rates or was it just okay as it was? Um, I think we upgraded our server, didn't we? So we had different server options there through Azure um, and we turned it up a little bit. It was nice having a good platform, you know. Um, Sandra, anything more to say on that? once we have that extra 20,000 just that's coming from Australia, it was completely fine, so, yeah. Yeah, it's nice having it on the, um, you know, Microsoft Azure system that is scalable so easily just by saying, yes, we'll pay a little bit more each month, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, then, well, thank you, Dr. Dalton. Thank you.